Good afternoon. My name is Graham Betcher and I serve as Executive Director of the Birmingham Museum of Art. I'd like to thank you for joining me today for my director's cut on American Impressionism. I think you can uh, catch a little glimpse of uh, Mary Cassatt painting uh, over my shoulder. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but, but first of all, I want to give, um, give you a sense of what Impressionism is. And we're going to be talking specifically about American artists who became followers, followers of the Impressionist movement. I think Cassatt is a good place to start because she was, is often claimed uh, as a French artist as much as she's claimed as an American because she spent her... Uh, her uh, mature years as an artist uh, living and working in France and exhibiting among the French uh, Impressionists. Um, but let me give you a little bit of background about the movement. And if I weren't afraid of at some point losing my signal, if I traveled too far between galleries, I probably would have begun uh, in our 19th century European gallery uh, with a glimpse of our uh, Monet seascape. Monet becomes, I think most of you know, a very seminal figure in the Impressionist movement. While uh, Impressionism dates uh, from the uh, 1860s, the term didn't come into uh, usage broadly until the 1870s, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. Impressionism is a movement that, you know, to put it one way, um, really tried to free, free the artists from being slaves to, to realism. Um, at the uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, um, the, uh, you know, for a long time an academic tradition uh, was uh, the, the standard, uh, and by that I mean uh, artists were taught to pay attention to sort of uh, grand historical subject matter, large history paintings, um, depicted in a very uh, realistic or even maybe exaggerated heroic um, style. Uh, and that when one did paint uh, genre subjects, one was still held to the same standard of, of painting things a as close to reality uh, as possible. And uh, while studying together, and I'm going to, to refer to my little cheat sheet here so I don't leave anyone out, so in the early 1860s, there were uh, four painters, uh, some of whom, uh, you're, the names of which you'll recognize immediately, Claude Monet, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Alfred Cécile, uh, Basile may be the one that your, your least first name, uh, Charles, and they uh, were very interested in, um, in landscape painting and uh, contemporary life, scenes of, of contemporary life uh, you know, out in the country or even in, in the city. Um, you know, for those of you who are interested in America, kind of forerunner of the Ashcan school in this country. Uh, but um, this wasn't really, uh, this wasn't really uh, part of the prescribed uh, course of study um, in, uh, you know, f formal French academic training uh, at that time. They took it upon themselves as, you know, kind of fr friends with a shared interest to begin going out into the countryside, uh, painting in the open air, uh, en plein air, uh, as they say in, in French, uh, and uh, making these uh, very uh, kind of uh, open form uh, gestural uh, compositions uh, of what they saw before them. And they had at their disposal kind of a, a vivid palette. Um, there had been a lot of synthetic paints that were introduced in the 19th century, which really brightened up the paint box. Um, some of the wonderful pastel colors that you see uh, in, in Impressionist painting um, were you know, relatively uh, recent uh, additions to the, the artist's uh, toolbox, so to speak. Um, and they became very interested uh, not just in you know, kind of the, the natural world around them, but at looking at the natural world at different times of day, um, um, different, different atmospheric effects, and, and showing, uh, as in the case, I think, very famously with Monet and his haystacks, which he um, showing how uh, something uh, could, over time, uh, in, a, in, a single, in a single day, based on the quality of the light and how the colors of a given subject matter um, would even change uh, based on 
the light. So much of Impressionism. Now, I mentioned to you uh, that the term itself uh, came into currency uh, in the 1870s, in 1874 specifically, and it was originally introduced as a pejorative term. Um, it, by a, an art critic named uh, Louis uh, Leroy, uh, and he uh, wrote in a, a French newspaper, uh, uh, Le Charivari, uh, which was a, a, sat a satirical um, uh, paper, sort of like Punch, if you know uh, that publication from, from Britain, um, his exact words, and it was a uh, sort of dialogue between uh, two skeptical viewers who were looking at a painting by Monet entitled uh, Impression Sunrise, which is painted in 1872. And the two viewers are having a conversation, and one of them says, quote, Impression, I was certain of it. I was just telling myself that since I was impressed, there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom, what ease of workmanship. A preliminary drawing for a wallpaper pattern is more finished than a seascape, uh, end quote. So it was meant to be a, a jab at these artists initially, at Monet in particular. Um, but these artists, uh, you know, had overcome adversity in the past. Um, I think some of you know that, uh, you know, the, the group banded together uh, when... Uh, when Patriot's works was rejected uh, from the Salon, um, namely it, uh, when uh, Edward Manet uh, submitted um, uh, Luncheon in the Grass, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, uh, to the Salon of 1863, um, it was rejected on the grounds that, you know, a nude subject had been introduced into a contemporary landscape. Uh, quelle horreur, what scandal, you know. Uh, this was, you know, certainly nudes were accepted at the uh, salons, uh, but very uh, classical nudes uh, in, in long ago and far away settings, not um, a, a nude uh, surrounded uh, by, uh, you know, surrounded by, you know, clothed men in a kind of a contemporary um, setting. So that was seen as very scandalous and shocking. So the painting was rejected. Uh, a, along with other works, um, and uh, it was actually the Emperor Napoleon III who suggested that the public be given a chance to make up their minds for themselves, and the uh, Salon des Refusés, the Salon of the Refused, uh, was organized. And so the, the public did get a chance for dis to decide for themselves, and critical ba backlash at first, eventually people came, you know, first the pu public uh, and then ultimately critics came to embrace um, what these artists were trying to achieve. And Impressionism had a profound effect on many, many subsequent artistic uh, movements uh, going into the 20th century. Um, it is, I think, one of the, you know, kind of first really uh, modern movements um, in, in art. To moving, moving us away from kind of a, as I said, a slavish, just what we see in, in front of us and making art something that's more subjective based on the interior life of the artist, but also in this case, more significantly, the way that our eye perceive things and how different viewers can perceive things uh, differently uh, in a single ist instance. Um, and letting the eye do a great deal of the work. So with that little bit of a pre, going to switch turn uh, this work by Mary Cassatt, which we are extremely fortunate to have in our collection. We've heard of Mary Cassatt and, and know that she was an American um, who spent her formative years as an artist in France. Um, she was uh, born in Allegheny City, Pennsylvania in 1884. Uh, she died in, uh, in France in 1926. Um, and I'm sorry, I've, I've given her birth year completely wrong. Forgive me. Um, she uh, was born earlier than 1884. She was already squarely in Paris uh, by, by 1884. In fact, uh, it was the year after the Civil War uh, that she moved, uh, moved to France, uh, initially against the objections of her family, um, though eventually, you know, they came with her as, as chaperones. Um, 
Mary Cassatt studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Uh, initially, she was largely satisfied um, with the training she received there because of some of the uh, strictures. They were not allowed to uh, participate in life drawing classes uh, to study from, from nude models the way that their male counterparts were, which struck her, I, I think, as fair. Now, granted, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, School of Fine Arts in, in Paris, uh, women were also, by that point, by the point she moved over, I believe, not able to study directly from uh, nudes, but some of the private schools um, that she had access to uh, in Paris, uh, she was able to participate in a uh, life drawing class. And she uh, initially studied with the, the great uh, history painter, uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme, uh, Jérôme, G-E-R-O-M-E. Uh, and uh, this had an, an influence on her, certainly on her um, skill. Uh, he was a great uh, technical painter, um, but pr probably one of the most profound relationships she crafted while she was in Paris was with the uh, the artist Edgar Degas, and it was through Degas that she gained uh, entree into the world of the French Impressionists, and ultimately exhibited alongside uh, Monet, Sisley, Renoir, um, all of the all of the greats, and is generally regarded as one of the great impressionist painters um, on either side of the pond, both as, you know, if we consider her to be American, but uh, also remember that the, the French like her an awful lot too and lay claim to her as well as, a, as an expat. So this particular work, which was uh, painted uh, in 1887, uh, was, um, this was, uh, it, it's generally thought to be a preliminary study uh, for a work that is in the collection of the National Gallery of Art. Um, not the Gallery of Art, but I'm much raw uh, and immediate. I want to take you in close to see the, the brush strokes and, you know, the way that the, the skin tones have been, you know, almost, it almost like sculpted with a paintbrush and made up not just of, you know, pinks, and reds, but also of the same gray um, that is used to paint uh, her hair. I think it's a wonderfully lively composition, and I love the way, and if I take it into, I'm gonna take it up close, but then we up. Our eyes begin to do the work and blend the composition, and you can see her come into sharper focus. It's really re remarkable. Um, so, uh, this is just a, a magnificent, uh, magnificent example of Cassatt's work. Um, if you do get a chance, and I'll try to post it on the comments section for this, if you do get a chance to see uh, this work, um, or the, the, the finished example, I think you'll see what I mean. The finished example, it's a perfectly nice example of Cassatt's work, but the figure almost seems a bit cartoonish. Um, and less so uh, in this case. So, um, and I apologize that the, it appears that we're having um, some problem with the sound cutting in and out. I'm getting a, a message that the uh, internet signal is uh, intermittent. I tested it this morning and I had full bars and so I apologize. This is part of what happens with a, uh, a live stream is that you're you know, sometimes you, you, you're not as lucky with the technology. So um, bear with me, um, and hopefully at the next part of the gallery we go to, um, we'll have a stronger signal. And I also think that uh, we'll repost this. Uh, sometimes the sound uh, in the recorded version uh, of the live stream is uh, a little better and not dependent on uh, the uh, wireless signal, so we'll, we'll see what happens. So apologies to those of you who are having uh, troubles. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna uh, walk this way. <laughs> so I wanna uh, take us now to the United States. This is a painting that dates from 1900 um, by uh, Child Hassam. Uh, Child Hassam was one of the American painters who was very a uh, very close follower of the French Impressionists. Um, this, the title of this work is Building the Schooner Provincetown. 
uh, painted in 1900, painted in Provincetown, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. And the, the title of this is not accidental. It's not building a schooner, it's building the schooner. Um, that's because at the time that this was painted, um, the citizens, uh, the boat builders, boat rights, I guess is the pro uh, proper term, in Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts, had all banded together after 25 years of not building a single ship in that town because they had been commissioned to build a luxury yacht for a Chicago businessman. Um, and so there, there aren't a lot of schooners building, being built in, uh, in Provincetown at this time. There is only one, the first uh, made in 25 years. So that was a very special event and gave, uh, gave Hassam in a way, a window into the past, something that someone hadn't seen since 1875. But I think you see some of the, um, you know, uh, tenets of impressionism that I previously discussed, beautifully expressed here, um, the effects of light. And I'm gonna take us in closer um, to see the way that the light hits the materials uh, on the beach. We have lumber sitting here, but we also have sand. We are right at the water's edge. We have the docks right here, and eventually the ship would be skidded right into the water um, on logs. Um, and you could see that they're, you know, building the, the hull of the ship um, almost with these staves, almost like building a, a, a barrel. Um, and we've got tiny little figures. I will say this about uh, Child Hassam. Um, he was a brilliant landscape uh, painter, um, not much of a figure painter. And so uh, in his oil paintings, his figures tend to be, um, you know, awfully uh, small, almost blending into the, the landscape. I do know of examples where the figures are slightly larger, some of his golfing um, pictures. And, um, you know, this is a personal opinion, but I, I just think that they're far less successful. But you get a sense of the... Um, that uh, you know that these people are working uh, through. It's a very very bright. And those of you who have spent time uh, working outside, whether it's in your garden or if some of you have an agricultural background uh, like I do and have uh, you know ever uh, worked out in a, a field, I mean, you've, I, I, this really resonates with me. Um, you know, kind of the the. Uh, condition uh, of the, the, both the quality of the light and, and a sense of the heat uh, of, the, uh, of working, you know, in the noonday sun. Uh, this is a painting that has a special uh, place in the history of the Birmingham Museum of Art. And this has been in our collection since 1956 and was the very first uh, significant American painting that this museum purchased. It was uh, purchased in 1956. It was the 22nd work of art to be purchased or to come into the collection that year. And we have some wonderful documentation in the file. It was purchased from uh, Milch Gallery in New York. And the, uh, the uh, dealer at Milch Gallery, uh, Joseph Gottlieb, wrote to our first director, um, Richard Howard, and talked about how during um, the Hassam's lifetime, Mr. and Mrs. Hassam would never part with this work and that it was Mrs. Hassam's um, personal uh, favorite. So it was only after they passed away that it became available uh, to an institution and we were fortunate enough to acquire it. Um, this is one of, of several uh, pictures that Hassam painted uh, on Cape Cod. I think Hassam in many ways was, was interested not just in capturing contemporary life, but ca capturing scenes of things that were about to be lost. Think about what was going on in 1900. I mean, we're in the, you know, kind of the midst of the, you know, a transformation in this country in terms of industry, urbanization. And, you know, I already said that this practice of building schooners, you know, this is a, those of you who've been to Provincetown know that it's, you know, a, a town that's defined by its relationship to the sea. This was even more so the case in the 19th century and the, you know, whaling ships and boat building and the fishing industry, lobstering, you know, uh, it is, and some of those old ways were, were in danger of dying out. And we see this 
uh, in, in other cases where Hassam, you know, both in his work on Cape Cod and his work on Long Island, Hassam was trying to document places and things that were soon quickly becoming part of uh, yesteryear. Now I'm going to turn next to the work of Theodore Earl Butler. Um, this is a painting that was done in New York City in 1918, simply entitled Flags. Uh, it was given to this museum uh, by Crawford and Marlene Taylor back in 2005. I'm uh, really grateful to have this. It's a superb example of Butler's work. I would say perhaps even the leading example of his work. Um, there is a nearly identical twin sister to this painting uh, that came up at Sotheby's a couple years ago um, and is uh, virtually indistinguishable except for the position of some of the flags and the, um, and the uh, vehicles at the bottom, which I think I'm going to get a little closer so you can see. So, uh, Butler, there is perhaps no better... Uh, you know, example of an American Impressionist than Butler because he was connected the most directly to the leading French Impressionist, Claude Monet. Um, he was quite literally a member of Monet's family. Um, Butler was uh, from the United States. He, he trained in New York and like many uh, American painters made his way to France to continue his studies found himself in Giverny, um, and where he had the opportunity to study with Claude Monet, um, and he developed a very intense friendship with Monet and became so close to the Monet family that he became Monet's son-in-law. Uh, he married uh, Monet's stepdaughters, and I stay stepdaughters. He was not a, 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 a polygamist. Uh, he was married to them uh, one after the other. He was married the Hoshide sisters. Uh, so he first married uh, Suzanne Hoshide. She passed away. Uh, and then uh, in 1900, uh, he married Suzanne's sister, uh, Marta. And so he was twice married uh, to respective stepdaughters of Claude Monet and was, uh, was, was therefore a part of the Monet family. So this was painted uh, at a time when Butler was effectively stuck in the United States. He had come to the U.S. to, to work on a, a major commission, a private commission. Then he stayed for the Armory Show in New York in 1913. And then uh, not long thereafter, the, set, the First World War broke out. And fearing for his safety, what would happen if he returned, uh, to, to France, uh, his family begged him to stay in the United States until the war is over. And that's exactly what he did. And so this painting, which depicts an allied flag celebration on Fifth Avenue uh, in New York in the October of, in October of 1918, and you can see a little bit of uh, St. Patrick's uh, sticking out in the background, the spires. But these, it's, very, it's a very exuberant uh, painting, and we see all the fl you know, flags of all the Allied powers. Um, it's, uh, it, it really vibrates uh, when you look at it. And I want to take you in close to look at the brushwork much closer than you could get if you were here. <laughs> Don't do this. As close as I am right now, I'm still maintaining a safe distance, but just barely but I want you to be able to see from home the really beautiful brushwork. So this, this composition is made up entirely of these small, quick brush strokes that when you pull away, the colors blend and the composition comes together and gives you this overall impression of a very lively, very exuberant, uh, Allied flag parade. Now, you can only imagine that, you know, this would have been a, a, something that had dual meaning uh, for, um, for Butler because this is, you know, nearing the end of the, of the war. Um, and, uh, you know, 
it was the following month when the Allies signed the armistice on November 11th. So this was painted, you know, just weeks away from the armistice when it started to become clear that the war would be over, which for Butler meant he could return to his family in Giverny. And so a, a definitely a cause for personal uh, celebration uh, as well. So um, this is just so fortunate to, to have this work. Um, and then finally, I want to show you this work uh, by Willard Metcalf entitled Pont Royal. Uh, and it is uh, by an American Impressionist, but done while he was in Paris studying the work of the, the French Impressionists. And so you notice that the works I've just showed you date from 1900, this is 1913, the last one was 1918. And so whereas, you know, in, in France, by the point that this was painted, um, a modern uh, idiom, um, remember that 1913, the year that this was done, was also the very same year as the Armory Show when Cubism and Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase uh, was introduced uh, in New York. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, a few years behind, if you will, um, but I don't want that to, you know, I, I guess they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And so the, the fact that, you know, with the exception of Cassatt, that American Impressionism is not exactly uh, concurrent with French Impressionism, I don't want you to think of it as, you know, somehow less deserving uh, of attention. Um, information didn't travel as quickly back then. Often to learn about something, you had to go and see it for yourself. And in the days before uh, air travel, that could take some doing. And artists would often go on a sort of grand tour uh, and spend uh, months at a time uh, in, uh, in there in Europe uh, and in Paris at this time in particular. Now, this is a painting that has a connection to uh, Child Hassam, whose work I previously discussed with you. Um, although it's painted by Willard uh, Leroy Metcalf, um, it was probably uh, painted from the exact same room where Child Hassam stayed 15 years before when he painted the same uh, bridge. Uh, we are uh, on the Rive Gauche, um, the left bank of the Seine in Paris, uh, and the thoroughfare um, at the, uh, the, the bridge that we're looking at is the, uh, the Quai Voltaire. And there's a hotel right there um, on the on the, the on our side of the bridge, let's say, and it's from a room in that hotel where first Hassam painted this bridge. I believe I want to say that that painting is in the collection of the Cincinnati Museum of Art. <laughs> we'll check later how good my memory is, and then we're fortunate to have this example. Um, this painting has an exhibition record. Um, about a mile long. It also has a very distinguished provenance. Um, the first owner of this painting was none other than Duncan Phillips, um, who is the, uh, the collector who later established the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., a fantastic museum, which I hope you'll have a chance um, to visit. And it traded hands many times, uh, was previously in the collection of the High Museum, um, in Atlanta, uh, they deaccessioned it at, at uh, some point. Um, can't say exactly why. Um, it might have been a point when American Impressionism was sort of not in favor, and they were looking for funds to uh, purchase something else. But a Birmingham couple, uh, Don and Barbara Cook, purchased it uh, and gave it to the Birmingham Museum of Art. And we're so grateful to have it in the collection. I think it's one of the you know, finest examples of, of Metcalf's works uh, done abroad. Um, there's certainly some very compelling uh, American subjects, um, but I love that we have uh, an, an example of a, a French subject. 
Um, so with that, the one thing I realize in hindsight that I neglected to mention, because people have asked me during these tours to talk about how various things come into the collection, I didn't tell you the, the rather compelling story uh, behind how the Mary Cassatt came into the collection. The Mary Cassatt was a work that was purchased by a Birmingham woman who lived in Paris. Her name was Mata Kniffen. And Mata Kniffen was married to a man named Leonard Kniffen, who was, I believe, the American head of Paul Mollive uh, soap uh, in Paris. And she lived in Paris, um, you know, right up until, I think, through the 1920s um, and right up until uh, the, uh, it became unsafe because of the, uh, uh, you know, outbreak of the Second World War and with the Nazis um, you know, kind of advancing their way. Um, they made their way, the couple made their way to Genoa, Italy, and then back to the United States. And one story I've heard is that they had to smuggle their art collection out of Europe, um, that they put it in a uh, steamer trunk and uh, they pinned the canvases to clothes, uh, and that sometimes the German soldiers would shoot up um, the steamer trunks is so that, you know, in case there was a person trying to um, escape from them in the steamer trunks. I, I don't know, um, you know, that's maybe an apocryphal story. I haven't been able to tell that story. But I did find an article from an American newspaper talking about Mr. and Mrs. Kniffen's dramatic escape from Europe. And it was published right after they arrived in the United States. Uh, and, it, and it talked about the, you know, kind of great uh, danger and risk that they took to their lives making their way from Paris to Genoa to get one of the last ships um, back to the United States. So we're doubly lucky uh, to have this here. Um, I think it's possible. I don't know for a fact, but um, we do know that uh, Mrs. Kniffen uh, really liked to collect the work of artists she knew uh, personally, she was a, a personal friend of the um, artist uh, Friedrich Friesegi. Um, she was, uh, she, we believe that she knew Henry Oswa Tanner. And given that uh, Cassatt died in 1926 when Mata Kniffen was still, uh, you know, was living in Paris, there is a chance that they perhaps um, knew one another personally. Maybe additional research um, will discover that. Uh, that fact. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining me today. I know we've had some intermittent sound problems. I apologize uh, for that, but thank you for bearing with me. And uh, tune in uh, this Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Daylight Time when I'll be broadcasting from the 19th Century European Gallery discussing 19th Century European sculpture. So look forward to seeing you then. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.